All right, let us now turn to considering Peter Singer's views on abortion proper, right? So we're gonna leave this stuff about the wrongness of killing, kind of to the side for now. We're gonna look at what he has to say about abortion, his discussion of abortion. <clears throat> he structures his discussion of the issue of abortion um, around the, uh, the typical pro-life argument. He structures it around the pro-life argument. I believe he calls it the conservative position or something like that, a conservative argument, conservative position. He displays this argument and then his discussion of abortion is uh, uh, put in terms of criticisms of that argument. So he's it's, it can get confusing and it's easy to get lost in the kind of back and forth. So what he so Singer himself is not pro-life. He does not agree with the pro-life argument or the conservative position, whatever you want to call it. What he's searching for is a good response to it, right? He's not pro-life. How do we respond to this pro-life argument? And what he's going to do is consider other responses that other pro-choice thinkers have given. And he, Peter Singer, is then going to criticize those responses. And so when you're in the middle of it, you might think, well, geez, Peter Singer, he's just like, um, he thinks all these pro-choice people are wrong. These pro-choice people have tried criticizing the pro-life argument in this or that way. And Singer's saying the criticisms don't work. These pro-choice criticisms don't work. That can mislead you, mislead the reader, into thinking that Singer is in fact pro-life. He's not at all. He just doesn't think that these pro-choice criticisms work, right? And so it's very important to keep, um, keep a handle on how that dialectic is working, how that argument is working, what exactly he's doing, right? He's not arguing for a pro-choice position, or he's not arguing for a pro-life position. Rather, he's ultimately pro-choice. He's arguing against other pro-choice positions. Why? Because he doesn't think they work. He doesn't think the arguments are any good, right? He thinks they get the true conclusion, that their conclusion that abortion is morally permissible, that that's a true conclusion and the pro-life position's uh, conclusion is false. But these pro-choice thinkers get there the wrong way. Their arguments aren't very good, right? And that's what Singer is showing. Okay, so let's get into it then. So what is the pro-life argument, the conservative position? Well, the first claim that they make is that it's wrong to kill an innocent human being. Fair enough. Then they claim that the fetus or embryo is an innocent human being, from which they conclude logically valid, uh, validly uh, that it's wrong to kill the fetus or embryo, that is to say that abortion is wrong. That's the kind of central conservative or pro-life position. Um, I think I like, I like using the fr uh, phrase terminology of pro-life better than conservative because there are, though they don't dominate our political scene, there are people who are uh, pro-life but are not conservative. So whatever, it doesn't really matter though. But Singer calls it conservative, I call it pro-life. There's the central argument, right? It's wrong to kill an innocent human being. The fetus is an innocent human being, so it's wrong to kill the fetus. Singer ultimately thinks that there's something wrong with this argument. Other pro-choice people do too. Singer is now going to consider other pro-choice responses to the argument. He's going to consider the kind of standard pro-choice responses, and he's going to criticize those criticisms. He doesn't think those pro-choice criticisms really work. And that's particularly bad, according to someone like Singer, because look, if we can't mount good sustainable criticisms of this argument, well, then it seems like the pro-life position, the conservative position, as he calls it, is strong. We need the strongest criticism of this argument. And what other pro-choice thinkers have given us is not that. <clears throat> what he's going to first focus on are pro-choice criticisms of premise two, that the fetus is an innocent human being. In his view, this is where most, uh, it seems, is what he thinks, this is where most kind of popular views, uh, uh, popular pro-choice views, or this is where a lot of them at least go. They try to criticize this idea. They deny that the fetus is an innocent human being. 
Well, okay. If you're going to do that, singer thinks, you need to, the pro-choice thinker, if they want to make that case that two is false, well, then you're going to have to draw a line between the embryo and the fetus on the one hand, and then a person with rights on the other hand. Something that is kind of just a biological mass, a mere cluster of cells with no important moral standing on the one hand, and then a person with rights on the other hand. So it's very clear that the pro-life thinkers want to draw that line, so to speak, at conception, that there is no line in the middle of an organism's development, that that line gets drawn at conception so that even the single cell, the embryo, is a person with rights. That's essentially what they're saying in premise two there. If a pro-choice person wants to dispute that premise and draw the line later, well, okay, great. Tell us where the line is. Where do we draw that line? Such that on, the, on one side of it, we have an embryo or a fetus that doesn't have any rights and doesn't have any moral standing. And on the other hand, we have you and me and other people who do have moral standing and rights. Where is that line to be drawn? And what Singer is now going to consider are a series of attempts to draw a line, uh, a series of different attempts that pro-choice people have given, and he's going to argue that none of them work, that the pro-life position has very strong responses to these attempts to draw a line. So let's consider this in detail. So there's uh, a line representing uh, your typical pregnancy, right? So that's going to represent nine months. With conception, the embryo at one end, yeah, that's just a single cell organism. You can see the mitochondria and whatever else is in there, nucleus, endoplasmic reticulum. And then at the other hand, we have a baby, right? Because the baby's born. So we have conception to birth. <clears throat> Where might the pro-choice thinker argue the line should be drawn such that before that line, it's permissible to kill the thing in question, it's permissible to perform an abortion, whereas after the, the line, on the other side of the line, it's impermissible to kill the thing. Well, one thing you hear often enough is that it might just be birth. Right? That seems like a plausible place, maybe, to put the line. Right? So prior to birth, the thing can be killed. The fetus could be killed. The embryo could be killed. Whereas after birth, well, now you've got a baby with rights. That thing can't be killed. It has rights. Right? You might think of that as an intuitive idea. So, so long as the thing is in the mother's womb, uh, it can be permissibly killed. Its life can permissibly be ended. And indeed, you might think, uh, so you oftentimes hear um, there is a somewhat famous exchange, this was years ago, between two senators, uh, neither of whom are senators anymore, between uh, Barbara Boxer of California and Rick Santorum of, I think he's from Pennsylvania. Um, in which they were kind of going back and forth over abortion, and it became clear that, um, and Rick Santorum was trying to press uh, Barbara Boxer on this point, um, it became clear that Barbara Boxer, who's a Democrat, and Rick Santorum is a Republican, uh, Rick Santorum's for life, Barbara Boxer's pro-choice, Barbara Boxer, it was fairly clear, wanted to draw the line at birth. Once the, the baby is born, that's when the thing's a person. Before that, abortion is permissible. And indeed, the way that Roe versus Wade works, that's essentially what Roe versus Wade holds as well. Um, you and I didn't become persons or 14th Amendment persons until we were born. Okay, so, uh, and you might just, I don't know, right? Prior to birth, it's in the mother's uh, womb. It's part of the mother, you might think. And so, yeah, if the mother wants to, she can abort it. Does birth mark this crucial difference? According to Peter Singer, this doesn't work. Birth can't be the line. That can't be the morally significant point. Because birth is really just a matter of 
I mean, to put it this way, to put it kind of bluntly, it's just a matter of physical location. And physical location doesn't turn a non-person into a person. It couldn't possibly have that kind of an effect. Whether or not something's a person doesn't depend on where exactly it is. It depends on kind of features internal to it, uh, presumably, yeah. And so where it is just doesn't matter. Singer gives an example of, um, well, let's say we have two different pregnancies and one of them, uh, the woman carries the baby to term. Uh, let's say the, the, the women got pregnant at the same time. One of them carries the baby to term, full term, nine months, but the other woman, um, her, her child is born prematurely. So bo born at eight months, say. Well, if birth were the crucial line before which a thing is not a person with no rights and after which the thing is a person with rights, well, then we'd be, we'd be committed to saying that the baby that was born prematurely is a person with rights, while the baby that's still in the womb is not, even though they are developmentally identical, they have all the same features and all the same capabilities. Or you can make the case even more extreme. Let's say, um, Uh, how would this go? Let's say the woman who carries the baby to term got pregnant a little bit earlier and the baby's really premature, you know, born, uh, born three months premature and the other baby is carried to term. The other, and I mean, the baby being carried to term was conceived uh, two months prior to the premature baby. Well, then we would have a case where we'd have the premature, prematurely born baby out in the world, but that baby is developmentally less far along than the baby that's still in utero, has fewer capabilities and capacities than the baby that's still in the mother's womb that's being carried to term. It's permissible to carry that baby that's, or to carry the fetus that's further along, that's more developed, that has more capabilities and capacities than the one that has less? That seems false. Uh, that's Singer's idea. So birth isn't going to be a very good line. Another way you can think of it really quick. Let's say you had a, and this would never happen. I don't think medical technology allows for this kind of thing, but let's say you had a woman who was pregnant with twins and somehow who knows what happens and we have the medical technology to do this, but one of the twins is born and the other isn't. One of the twins is born prematurely, but the other kind of stays in there. Well, if birth is the crucial line, then it seems like, well, if the one that was born can't kill it. It's a person with rights. Whereas the one that's in there is um, uh, not, is killable permissibly, uh, is permissibly killable. That seems odd, right? They're developmentally identical. That's, and so birth is not going to be a good response. That's not going to be a good way of drawing the line. And so trying to establish that the fetus is, an, uh, is not an innocent human being doesn't work. That pro-choice attempt to undercut the pro-life argument doesn't work. Okay, well, let's go back a little bit then. Remember Roe versus Wade, it was all about viability. Maybe viability is the point before which a thing can be permissibly aborted or killed, after which it becomes impermissible. Now, Roe versus Wade does, you know, it's a little bit different. It, Roe versus Wade doesn't think you become a person at viability. You only become a person upon birth, but the state can nonetheless uh, pass regulations to, uh, to protect the fetus at the point of viability and onward. But put that complication to the side. Um, aside from Roe versus Wade, somebody might say, well, no, viability is a crucial point. That's when a thing becomes a person. Prior to viability, not a person, doesn't have rights. That's what Singer considers now. And you may have found Roe versus Wade somewhat compelling because there seemed to be something intuitive about this. Yeah, viability, I don't know. Yeah, like it's more likely than not to survive at that point. That seems like a good line. That's when the thing kind of becomes independent to some degree in its own thing. And so at that point, that seems morally significant. At that point, yeah, maybe that thing's a person now. Maybe we want to say that that thing has a right to life. And Prior to then, no, it's kind of just, you know, a, a biological mass or a cluster of cells or whatever. According to Peter Singer, 
this way of drawing the line doesn't work either. This doesn't work. And he gives a series of considerations. First, if viability were the crucial line, well, that would have an awkward consequence. Namely, whether or not the fetus is a person would depend upon where the mother is. And that seemed, that's too bizarre. That can't be true. I th again, whether or not a thing is a person seems to be dependent upon its internal capabilities or features or something internal to it. It doesn't depend upon where the mother is. If, you know, right? And so Singer's example is, let's say the mother is in New York City. Well, then the line of viability is going to be, um, say, 24 weeks, right? Because uh, given the med medical technology readily available to her, uh, a baby born at 24 weeks is more likely than not to survive. But if that same woman takes a trip to some rural place, I can't remember a singer's example exam uh, exactly, but some say it takes a trip to some country that doesn't have nearly so uh, advanced uh, medical technology and she goes to some rural place in that country where there's no hospital really around, well, then all of a sudden viability would be pushed much later, maybe like 30 weeks, right? Because babies born prior to that point in time in that location uh, are likely not to survive. Right? A baby born at 28 weeks in some rural location in the middle of wherever, right, probably not going to survive. Whereas if that same baby were born at that same time in New York City, it would survive. Right? So viability shifts depending on where the mother is. If viability is the crucial line after which a thing is a person, that would mean the personhood line shifts. So that would mean that the woman, when she's in New York City and she's, uh, say, 25 weeks pregnant, She's got a person with rights in her womb, and to kill it would be tantamount to murder. But if she gets on a plane and travels in the middle of nowhere, well, all of a sudden that thing's no longer a person, and it's not murder or tantamount to murder to kill the thing. It doesn't have any rights. It's not a person. That seems, that's not right. That's not how personhood, that's not how personhood works, right? And so viability doesn't look like it's the line. It doesn't look like it's this morally crucial um, uh, dividing point. A second argument he gives. I'd mentioned one of the reasons that viability looks promising is because at the point of viability, the you might think the baby acquired the fetus acquires some degree of independence. It's more likely than not to survive on its own were it born. And so the idea might be that why, you know, why is viability this crucial line? Because after viability, the baby is just st statistically speaking, no longer dependent upon the mother. No longer uh, uh, kind of, uh, yeah, essentially dependent upon the mother for its life. Whereas prior to viability, it is dependent upon the mother. It can't survive on its own, or statistically speaking, it won't survive on its own, whereas after viability, it will. And so it's really dependence that's crucially important. Well, you can say many of the same things about dependence, as we just said about viability, right? Whether or not the, the fetus is dependent upon the mother is going to depend upon geographic location of the mother. Uh, that seems odd. That doesn't seem right. Um, that seems incorrect. Person who doesn't shift like that. But what Singer points out here is that dependence can't, just because one person is dependent upon another doesn't mean the one person can kill the other, right? That just doesn't follow. Dependence doesn't do that kind of moral work. And so just because the fetus is dependent upon the mother at viability, that doesn't entail or imply that the mother can therefore abort the fetus. Dependence doesn't do that. And he gives a series of examples that show this, right? So um, just be, let's say you're out hiking in your five days hike from civilization. You're hiking with a friend and your friend breaks their leg. 
I mean, not to be too grisly about it, but that doesn't mean you can pull out your knife and kill your friend. You can't do that, right? Even though they are completely dependent upon you for their survival, right? Your friend with the broken leg now is totally dependent on you for their survival. In the same way that the fetus is dependent upon the mother for its survival. Well, just because your friend's dependent upon you doesn't mean you can kill him, right? And so by the same token, just because the fetus is dependent upon the mother, that doesn't give a good reason for why the mother should be, uh, why it's morally permissible for the mother to kill the fetus, right? So that doesn't work. Dependence, viability doesn't work. That's not a good place to draw the line, according to Peter Singer, right? <clears throat> and so these attempts to undermine the pro-life argument don't work. Consider another one. How about quickening? Quickening is the time at which the mother can first feel the in utero fetus move, right? First feel a kick, something like that. And it's very, it's very variable. Somewhere between 15 to 20 weeks is when it typically happens. It happens, how does it work? I think later for uh, first pregnancies and earlier for subsequent pregnancies. I can't remember how it works. Uh, but you put it somewhere around 18 weeks. That's when the mother can first feel um, the baby move. Um, Peter Singer talks about this in terms of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church had put something like this forward back in the medieval time. Uh, medieval times. They no longer think uh, the Catholic Church no longer thinks that quickening is morally significant. Um, um, some religious traditions today, you can still find people saying that quickening is important. Uh, the idea was when the mother can feel the fetus move, well, that's when the soul is kind of implanted or formed in the fetus. That's when the soul comes to be, right? And so, yeah, at that point, you now have a human being. It's got a soul, whereas prior to then, it was just a bunch of cells or something like that. But Singer's going to want to say that doesn't work. Why? Well, because it's obviously based on an outdated embryology. We know that that's not, in fact, how... Um, um, embryos and fetuses develop. And indeed, that's why the Catholic Church has subsequently abandoned anything to do with quickening, um, because their views about the immorality of abortion after quickening were dependent upon a certain view of embryology, which they, uh, which was shown to be false by medical researchers or even the advanced. We know more about how embryos and fetuses develop. Um, and so that's not going to work, right? Basically. Not a whole lot more to say about that. Based on our data memory, so Singer says that that doesn't work. And the last thing he considers is consciousness. You might think, yeah, that seems like a good contender. Why not say that? Singer uh, thinks this doesn't work either. But the reason he gives, he doesn't really give an argument against it. He says nobody wants it to be there. <laughs> Nobody's actually put this forward as a serious contender. Pro-life people don't want to say consciousness is the crucial turning point because that would mean that certain abortions are permissible. But pro-choice people, by and large, don't want to say consciousness is the crucial turning point in the development of the fetus either. Why? Because it looks like consciousness might start really early. I mean... At its earliest, it could start as early as seven weeks, right? We, we do, you know, scientists, researchers have done scans of fetuses, of their brain activity, of the brain development, and so on. It's highly, highly, highly unlikely unli that there's anything resembling consciousness prior to six weeks. It's highly unlikely that there's consciousness at seven weeks. But it could start occurring in some rudimentary form as early as seven weeks. No, and so a pro-choice person, however, does not want to draw the line here because that would indicate if consciousness were what made a person a person, well, that would indicate that a seven-week-old fetus or embryo, I don't know what the thing is technically called at seven weeks, uh, that, that that would be a person and with a right to life. And so uh, an abortion at 10 weeks would be morally impermissible. 
pro-choice people, uh, by and, they don't want to say that. That's not the view that they're arguing for. They'd like that line to be much later. And so Singer doesn't really consider consciousness, <clears throat> or he kind of just puts it to the side. He doesn't really argue against it, because in his view, nobody's actually putting that forward. Um, which is interesting, I suppose. But so that's not going to work. That's not going to do, think of it this way, that's not going to work for the pro-choice thinker. That's not going to give us <clears throat> uh, a good line to draw. That's not going to give us a good reply to the pro-life argument. That's what Singer's looking like for. And so none of these pro-choice replies to the pro-life argument really work. They don't give a good reply. And so Peter Singer thinks we need to find another way of responding to the pro-life argument. We've considered all of these contenders. They don't work, though. The pro-life argument can, uh, the pro-life thinker can kind of respond to all of these arguments and respond pretty strongly, respond pretty well, right? So these pro-choice criticisms don't work. That's a problem, according to Peter Singer, because he's ultimately trying to argue for a pro-choice position. And so we want arguments that work. We want a reply to the pro-life argument that works.